Hello, my name is Lee Presser. This is my show. I speak frequently to very interesting people. Some of these conversations are so exciting, so intellectually stimulating, I thought others might like to listen in. This is the reason we started recording Conversation with Lee Presser. Welcome to Conversation with Lee Presser. The Show Me Institute is a research and educational organization dedicated to improving the quality of life in Missouri by advancing sensible, well-researched solutions to state and local policy issues. Institute scholars study public policy problems and develop proposals to increase economic opportunity. Those solutions are presented in a written study, briefing papers, and educational materials which help policymakers, the media, and the general public gain a better understanding of those issues. One of those analysts is David Stokes. In his work, he focuses on issues involving local taxation, government structure, utilities, and transportation. His objective is to suggest mechanisms which allow the private sector to perform public sector services. David Stokes, welcome to the conversation. Thank you, Lee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear on the program. Well, we're glad to have the Show Me Institute uh, here represented. We've heard a lot about you in the past, and uh, we're, we're glad to have you. We're delighted to be here. Well, why don't you just do a little background. Tell people who don't know what the Show Me Institute is, and you're also being seen in Illinois, so they probably have never heard of it unless they see it in the Post-Dispatch. Um, you know, what is the organization? Where did it come from? What's the, uh, the history, which starts, I think, in 05? Is that right? We, we were started up in 2005. We began publishing our first, our first policy studies in 2006. First, we, why did we start? We, are, we were started by our board members, uh, Crosby Kemper and Rex Sinkfield in particular, to bring a, a pro-free market public policy institute or think tank to Missouri. Mm -hmm. And so we were, most states have something like us, Illinois, for your Illinois viewers, has the Illinois Policy Institute. But uh, the Show Me Institute is Missouri's local think tank who, where we promote, discuss, debate, free market solutions to public policy issues at the state and local level in Missouri. We cover cities and counties too. Do you do this because you've been hired uh, as contractors uh, to uh, look at a particular issue or you guys just search out issues of interest to yourselves and do it? Well, the latter primarily. We have a board, we have a board of uh, 11, I believe it's 11 members right now, and they direct the operations of the Institute and they ultimately determine what we're going to research in. We have six primary areas of study. Those include education, corporate welfare, uh, health care, taxes, privatization, where a lot of my work is done, and red tape. And as long as we have internal scholars and external scholars who conduct research in those areas, we don't do any contract work. You know, we can't be hired to perform a study for any particular group or individual. And then once we do the work, we take it to the public and take it to the media, take it to legislators, and try and affect a pro-free market change in Missouri. We're just, we're a nonprofit charity. We're a tax-exempt 501c3 entity. We're, we have donors throughout the state and, and granting agencies throughout the country who are willing to support our work. You uh, provide this information to policymakers, as I said at the intro. Uh, how is your information received by them? Well, uh, and, and I don't mean the mechanism <laughs> by which, I mean how, how do they like what, you're, what they're receiving? Well, there are some policymakers who like it a great deal and some policymakers who, who disagree with it strongly. We always appreciate the opportunity to work in areas such as eminent domain, which sort of cross party lines. There's no one party that stands out in its support of school choice, for instance. Mm -hmm. So those opportunities that cross party lines, eminent domain, school choice, a few others, are really a, a great opportunity for the Show Me Institute to reach out and work with legislators who often don't agree with us on certain issues. But that's fine, we're, we're definitely there to to build relationships and focus on the areas of agreement and not the areas of disagreement. What have you learned about eminent domain that's uh, of great interest to the public? Well, we've done two policy studies on eminent domain, plus some op-ed commentaries and some, some numerous blog posts. Uh, Tim Lee, our former editor, and Timothy Sandifer, a, a well-known attorney and writer from the Pacific Legal Foundation, they've done our eminent domain studies. And they, the point is to just to document the terrible abuse that Missouri has seen, like many other states and local areas, of the government taking private property for private uses. Right. And it's been going on for some time, taking a ho home or a group of homes from a home homeowner to give it to a developer 
because that community very narrowly, the government of that suburb or city very, very narrowly sees their tax base short-term increases in sales tax mm -hmm. because of that maneuver. But we believe it's a, it's a terrible abuse of, of property rights and abuse of, of the law to take private property for the private gains of others. Years ago, we had uh, Anthony Martin uh, was a guest here. I believe he was uh, appointed by uh, then Governor Blunt to uh, sit on an eminent domain board or commission or something. And uh, he said that he personally went around and talked to a lot of people uh, to gather information as to what uh, what was perceived as abuse. Anthony is a, is a friend of mine and he has t spoken with the Show Me Institute in the past when he was Governor Blunt's ombudsman for eminent domain issues. He talked with our institute about, about the issue. It's really an issue that in most parts of Missouri you can find abuses of eminent domain and in many, many other states. In fact, the, mo the famous Supreme Court decision came from Connecticut mm -hmm. that sort of said you can do this and many state legislators then address that at their state level to uh, to varying degrees of success in missouri we saw a tightening of the rules of eminent domain uh, good positive steps i think at the show me institute and the scholars who write about it for the show me institute didn't think those steps went quite far enough mm -hmm. uh, you, oh, another part of your portfolio is transportation um, what kind of work have you been doing on transportation and uh, what well, what have you been doing in transportation? And we'll talk about it. We have a, a wide ranging area of transportation, be it investment in, in infrastructure, uh, improving congestion, those types, of, those types of deals. A lot of it comes back down to the inclusion of tolling and pricing mechanisms in transportation. As a Professor Rick Hafer from SIUE wrote in an op-ed for us, if you wanna eliminate congestion on the new bridge over the Mississippi River, there's really only one way to do it, and that's to price that bridge. There's a thing called the, the law of highway congestion, which is that it's very, very difficult to just simply build your way out of congestion because there's always, there's always on a crowded road, there's people who aren't getting on it because it's crowded. Then you expand it and those people get on that road. The way to fight congestion is through road pricing of highways, which has been very successful in other parts of the country, particularly some of the roads out in, in California where the, the toll rate fluctuates according to the, the time of day and the, and the travel level, to always guarantee free, free flowing traffic. Mm -hmm. That's very difficult to get in Missouri because it's against the state constitution for MoDOT to include the state highway fund on anything to do with toll roads. That could be a problem. That is a big, big problem. So we have uh, encouraged that the state legislature consider uh, putting that back on the ballot. I was just talking about that last night in an event. We think Missourians will have to decide on that. In the short term, there are options through public-private partnerships in Missouri and Missouri transportation corporations that uh, can allow for toll roads in certain situations. But the, the prohibitions on it are such that the state of Missouri only has one tolled asset, and that's a, the Lake Ozark Community Bridge over, over the Lake of the Ozarks. It's the only toll road in the entire state of Missouri. Mm -hmm. There, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, Ed Hassinger, who is the, uh, dis the MoDOT district engineer for the St. Louis area, has talked about the uh, necessity of rebuilding Interstate 70 from the outskirts of St. Louis to the outskirts of uh, Kansas City. And there has even been talk about a very interesting idea of actually segregating and creating a separate parallel set of roads for trucks and for cars. And then the the, ro the, the trucks, I guess, would be much, much thicker because cars don't do much damage to roads. Is this the kind of thing that you're talking about in order to pay for that to uh, turn Interstate 70 into a toll road? Well, yes, those are the type of ideas that we think the people of Missouri should consider. We released a, a case study just a few weeks ago by a scholar named Jerome Day, who, which advocated a, a significant investment in the cross-state corridor of I-70 and sort of constructing a new I-70 north about 20 miles, 25 miles north of the current I-70 to handle the projected traffic over the next several decades. He advocated the heavy use of public-private partnerships and private investment in that transportation investment along with tolling and along with increased capacity for rail, particularly mm -hmm. freight rail, to, to return in, in his paper he wanted to, to to propel Missouri forward to, to return to its status as a transportation hub of America, which it was many, many years ago. Well, being we in the center of the country, that. it's kind of important. Absolutely. 
And MoDOT's ideas for truck-only lanes are, are very interesting and, uh, and something we've, we've looked at. And some scholars at the Show Me Institute would support it, and, and some don't necessarily support it. Mm -hmm. um, but so the tolling is a mechanism by which to do that. And MoDOT as an, as an entity, it really in the past several years, has really, it's really become a forward-looking government, government agency. MoDOT, yes. The MoDOT, they, they've really changed quite a bit. They've, they're doing terrific work, and they're willing, to, under Pete Ron and now the, the new director, Kevin Keith, they're, they're willing to consider a lot of, of new ideas. And that's very interesting. Even if those ideas don't get enacted, it's neat to see them at least thinking of new ways to, do, to deliver the best transportation assets for Missourians. Have you been thinking about high-speed rail? Yes, we have. We, we published a study by Randall O'Toole from the Cato Institute entitled Why Missouri Should Not Build High-Speed Rail. Explain so, those reasons. Well, the primary reason that why we should not invest hundreds of millions, potentially more, in high-speed rail is that it is just a, it's a transportation asset that is heavily subsidized. It's used by a very small number of people. And MoDOT, the transportation high-speed rail initiatives out of the stimulus funds that MoDOT received are much smarter than, uh, than what uh, this paper addressed. They're much more localized. They're much more targeted. And all they really intend to do is improve the average speed slightly, but really improve the dependency and the on-time performance of the existing Amtrak route across Missouri. So we have praised MoDOT for their high-speed rail initiatives, which are very reasonable, very engineering-based, and very solid, and not particularly expensive as these things go. The national view of, of a billions and billions into a high-speed rail network that will, that will connect all of uh, America is, uh, according to Randall O'Toole and many other scholars, it's just sort of a boondoggle that's going to cost an enormous amount of money to eventually serve a very small number of people. I just read that the, and of course China is now famous for, for high-speed rail, but I just read where their minister of railroads is like being thrown in jail or something because of, because of high-speed rail and all the money that he's raked off of that. There seems to be uh, quite a bit of an opportunity to, uh, for graft. Well, you can read about the history of high-speed rail in Randall O'Toole's study for the Show Me Institute, uh, Why Missouri Should Not Build High-Speed Rail, and it, that's available at showmeinstitute.org, along with all of our policy studies and case studies. And he talks about how, in Japan, the first line they built between two of the world's most heavily populated areas, Tokyo, Osaka, that was successful, and that mm -hmm. has been successful, because you have, you have tens of base, millions of right. people. Similar how the the high-speed rail train on the, the east coast of the United States connecting Boston, Washington, New York City, and others right. is successful because you have the population to support that. Plus, they also have the public transportation system at the other end once you get off that train. But if you were to take high-speed rail from St. Louis to Kansas City, what do you do when you get off the train in Kansas City? <laughs> exactly. High Rent a car. <laughs> right. Well, high speed, and Randall O'Toole discusses all that, and that high-speed rail ends up serving people who he calls it bankers, lawyers, and bureaucrats. Uh, the people who work downtown go, when they travel for work, they go from downtown to downtown. And those are people who do not need to be subsidized by other taxpayers. Mm -hmm. They can afford the, the real cost of rail or, or plane or whatever. And we don't need uh, the average taxpayer subsidizing something that generally people who don't need to be subsidized will be using. Speaking of subsidations, um, subsidizing, um, Metrolink in St. Louis. Um, have you had any studies or discussions about Metrolink or Metrolink expansion? We've had a series of op-eds written on expansion and tax increases for Metrolink. Yes um, both, or no? Um, well, both, both actually. We, we're an, the Institute doesn't take formal positions on things. We, we, are a, we facilitate the work of scholars. Mm -hmm. So the Show Me Institute has internal scholars such as myself, and external scholars who are often PhD economists and terrific economists from around the country. And they publish, they and we do research, and our ideas are supposed to stand on our own. So with Metrolink, we wrote op-eds advocating, discussing, debating both sides of the issue. Uh, in general, um, Metrolink, nobody's going to deny that Metrolink has some good aspects to it, and there's some, there's some benefits to it. But it, like many things, is, uh, is heavily, heavily subsidized mm -hmm. by the many people who don't use it. And uh, I've discussed the potential of increasing prices on it to, to reduce the subsidy while at the same time not increasing the monthly passes 
by nearly as much. That, that allows the people, the lower income people who really need public transportation to continue to, to use it and not be priced out of it, while the people who use it to go down to a ball game, uh, they don't need to be subsidized for that. They should pay more of the, the true cost of it. I understand, and, and we're, done gonna, we're gonna be done with this conversation here, uh, but um, I understand that under federal law, technically, running those trains down to ball games is outside of the, uh, the, the federal law, which allows for all this funding for, uh, for Metrolink. Well, I, d I don't know on the, how that exact question I, I talked works. to an expert on this, and he was kind of like, eh, eh, you're not supposed to be doing that kind of stuff. This is actually about actually moving people who can't afford to get around uh, without, without public transport, as opposed to people who are living very nicely out in West County or in South County and then bringing them uh, to the downtown so that they don't bring their cars. But let's move on to education, which is another area that you're interested in. Uh, what sort of work have you been doing there? Well, we have a number of our education work has been done in-house through, through, through our own policy analysts, and we have uh, external scholars as well, such as Dr. Michael Podgurski at the University of Missouri, who have written a great deal on education. And a lot of it is just discussing the benefits of, of more choice and more tuition tax credits for schools. We have an entire paper on the potential for the use of tuition tax credits to allow to give more school choice to Missourians. Um, but a great deal just deals with tr the benefits of charter schools, the pluses and minuses of charter schools. What are the benefits of and minuses of uh, charter schools? Well, the benefits of charter schools are flexibility, more parental involvement, more direct control by the more by the people involved in the educating of the, of the students that day, mm -hmm. the immediate teachers, the immediate administrators of that schools. Uh, another benefit of charter schools is actually, some might think of as a weakness, in that when charter schools don't perform well, and there have certainly been reports of charter schools in St. Louis not performing well, unlike poor performing public schools, those charter schools close. Yeah, they go out of business. If they don't do a good job, parents will pull their, their students out uh, the other supporters will remove their support and they will close. And that's a good thing about it. If it's not working, it should close. Mm -hmm. But there are charter schools in St. Louis and in Kansas City as well that are doing amazing work for, uh, for, for students and giving an opportunity for students who otherwise would have been stuck in non-performing public schools. And nationwide, I mean, charter schools have shown that they're, Carolyn Hoxby, a professor out at Stanford, has done a study on New York charter schools that showed just how the students who are enrolled in the charter schools there are outperforming the students in the in the public schools and it's a very high level study that that has that has a lot of good information behind it now I bet that, <coughs> excuse me again um, I'll bet that you find that the uh, schools out in the county most of them are actually pretty decent public schools I'm talking about and are actually educating kids fairly well isn't it true that mostly it's the inner city schools and some of the North County schools that are the real problem that causes the legislature problems? Well, I'm, I'm not our education policy analyst, so, so I, don't, I know what we've, we've generally published on the, the issue. And sure, the, so much of the issues that we have are with, with urban public schools, but I, I think there's issues at education throughout the state of Missouri and, mm -hmm. and funding issues and I'm just shocked, you know, we've had uh, Diane Borisaw, former superintendent of, of schools for St. Louis City. We've had um, uh, Richard Gaines, who's on the uh, appointed board, Rick Sullivan, uh, Eddie Davis, who used to be on the elected board. Everybody coming here and talking about just the problems that the schools in the city have had for, well, we're talking decades now. And I don't see, and you know, kids have come and gone. Half of them don't graduate. And I just wondered if you folks had any suggestions for the legislature as to, other than just taking over the system and appointing a few guys to run it, what should be done with all these children and what should be the goals of the schools? Well, the Show Me Institute scholars have encouraged the, ex the expansion, making it easier to start charter schools uh, involving greater greater choice throughout throughout the state. They shouldn't just be limited to St. Louis and Kansas City because there are struggling school districts in other parts of St. Louis County and in rural Missouri. Uh, we should have, uh, we have a paper on tuition tax credits making it easier for, for parents to send their children to private schools if they're stuck in a failing school, mm -hmm. school system. There are many problems with with public education, and there are solutions to it. Nobody's opposed to the public education system. Mm -hmm. We had a 
Professor Frederick Hess from the American Enterprise Institute wrote an entire study for us on mayoral takeovers of the school district. And it was a very interesting study that discussed the cities that have been most successful with state takeovers of failing school districts are one that really accountability was went all the way along with that <coughs> takeover. Where one person was empowered to appoint one person was in charge, mm -hmm. like the mayor of Chicago successfully took over their public school district and appointed a new superintendent who did a terrific job. Uh, he's now moved on to, to bigger and better things in public education. What we did in Missouri, uh, Professor Hess thought there was good and bad to it in that the governor appointed one person to the new board, the mayor one person, and the president of the board of aldermen. Uh, Mr. Hess thought that that reduced the accountability somewhat, is that who do you blame if it doesn't go, go right? Is the governor, the president of the Board of Aldermen, or the mayor? But still... The teachers. They, blame, well, <laughs> they keep blaming the teachers. <laughs> but still, that, that new board has definitely made improvements in the, in the public school district. And the, the, the mayor and president of the Board of Aldermen, and, and I believe the two governors who directed their appointees to it deserve credit, and the members of that special board that's governing the city public school district deserve a lot of credit. They've mm -hmm. done a good job. Okay. Do you mention that you also um, have interests in infrastructure? Um, I, I guess I'm going to ask the question about water infrastructure or, or other kind of piped infrastructure. Is this, is this another study area of yours? Right. We've released uh, some case studies and a number of op-eds on on private versus public provision of utilities in Missouri. Uh, St. Louis County, where I live and where I believe you live, is one of the largest areas of the country where just about all the utilities are provided by private investor-owned entities. Uh, Ameren UE, the Klee Gas, Missouri American Water. In many other parts of the country, it's more common for publicly owned utilities to provide these types of services, particularly in water. So we've released a case study encouraging the city of St. Louis to auction off and begin the effort of privatizing its water division, which is worth hundreds of millions of dollars potentially, which would put all the assets of the water facility back on the tax rolls. And it has a number of long-term and short-term benefits. The problem is that too often Germany, uh, you know, German companies are buying these, uh, th these water plants. I can't tell you the amount of water that's owned in the United States by uh, Germans and other foreign nationals. Well, I don't see anything wrong with that uh, automatically. I don't, I don't have a problem with that, provided that they're meeting the market demands of their customers. In fact, Missouri American was German-owned at some point, and then the, the company divested its American operations into, into American Water Company, and Missouri American and Illinois American Water are the local divisions that, that deal with those. Mm -hmm. But that's now an American-owned company. Um, but I don't, I don't have a, an issue with foreign-owned operation of American assets. I think that they're still, as long as they're responding to market demands and, and are meeting the basic health and safety requirements that are set, I think that's, that's fine. But there are, there are cities in Missouri, Jefferson City and Joplin, where most of the utilities are provided privately, investor-owned companies. And then right nearby, Springfield and Columbia will have all their utilities done by publicly-owned companies. And it's a, it's a very interesting question. People also often get an attachment to their local utility. They think, for some reason, Kirkwood has to have its own electric and, and water company, and that they're one of the few areas of St. Louis County that it's publicly done. Um, I don't agree with that. I think that the private sector can do the job just as well. There are numbers, there are numerous studies shown that we cite in our case studies on uh, these issues that show the private sector tends to do a better job. Though not universally, there are certainly well-run public utilities that do a good job. The private actors do a very good job in providing these services. They meet all the requirements and demands. The prices are very comparable, sometimes less and sometimes a little more. And uh, so we encourage people throughout the state to, to look at to look at privatization of utilities. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got about four minutes left. I told you things go by they really do, fast They do, here. it's been a lot um, of fun. Is there anything that we haven't talked about? First of all, again, all of your papers are available online through your website, right? Everything and that website is? www.showmeinstitute.org. Okay. I don't think you've had to say the www for about 10 years, <laughs> but what the, what the heck. Okay, now, now we got that out of the way, and people can go and read these papers if they find them that they want to uh, follow up on this. What other areas haven't we covered yet that you'd like to talk about? Well, absolutely. Everything we've ever published, videos we've done, op newspaper op-eds, case studies, policy studies, copies of testimony we've given, everything is available at that website. And there's a lot of good information there, and we encourage everybody to check it out if you're interested. Uh, the main other area we've talked about so much is, is taxation. 
and income taxes and earnings taxes in particular. It's probably our best known area of work. Dr. Haslig from the University of Missouri and our chief economist has written three studies on earnings taxes in Missouri and St. Louis and Kansas City specifically. Uh, we've released a series of studies on income taxation and the, the, the benefits to Missouri potentially considering eliminating its state income tax. Like uh, the census numbers just showed that came out just a few weeks ago, the states that don't have income taxes were gaining population and gaining congressional representation at the expense of states with higher income taxes, local state income taxes. Um, Dr. Hasslick has demonstrated the harm that the earnings tax does to St. Louis and Kansas City. This is the earning tax that you find um, people who work only work in the city. They We're have to pay, what is it, like a 1% of their wages go to this earning tax? Correct. If you work or live in St. Louis or in Kansas City, you owe 1% of your income. Oh, so even if you the live state. there and you work out in the county, you, owe the you, still, you still owe this, uh, this earnings tax. Right. And the, state, uh, the city of St. Louis then has a half a percent payroll tax, which employers within the city pay on their, on their employees. Mm -hmm. So theirs is a 1.5% tax, and in Kansas City it's a 1% tax. And Dr. Hasslick studied the effects of this, both in Missouri and nationally, cities with earnings taxes and without. And he, he found that cities, central cities with earnings taxes consistently grow, grow more slowly compared to their neighboring suburbs within their own metropolitan statistical area than cities that don't have earnings taxes. And all the detailed research is available online on that. And that's a, a real big issue. We've just had votes in, in, in November in St. Louis and Kansas City, where the state, I'm sorry, statewide, which uh, prohibited future cities to impose earnings taxes and has now required that the St. Louis and Kansas City put it on the ballot for their own citizens to decide. Mm -hmm. And in April, St. Louisans and residents of Kansas City will be, be voting whether or not they want to keep their local earnings taxes or phase it out over a 10 year period and uh, replace it through a variety of, a variety of ways. And mm -hmm. that's what the Show Me Institute is. One of the major things we're researching right now is ways to replace it. And your institute's president, uh, Mr. Sinkfeld, he, he's a big promoter of, uh, of that, isn't he? Well, he, Mr. Of, Sinkfield. Of, of making the change from, from tax to no tax. Right, and he, he, has entity, he has advisors and groups outside of the Show Me Institute, separate from the Show Me Institute, that do more political-based right, work. Right, because you're not a political group. We're a tax-exempt nonprofit charity, and so we've in, been involved in, in researching the question. And then we put the research out there, and people supporting a, of the idea, opposed to the idea, undecided, can look at our research and, and make up their own mind. If you have anything really quick to say, because we are out of time. Just that we've, in the next couple months, we're going to be releasing major work on, on property taxation in Missouri, on forfeiture laws, criminal and civil forfeiture laws in Missouri, and on you know, the public ownership of land in, in large cities and in ways to improve all three of those areas. Well, we're going to have to have you back and uh, talk further about those studies and others that you've done. Uh, I've read some of the ones in preparation for, uh, for this discussion. I'll have to go back and read some more. I hope that the audience does as well. Thank you very much for being with us, David Stokes. Thank you, My Mr. guest today has been David Stokes of the uh, Show Me Institute in Missouri. Um, we've had a very interesting discussion. I would suggest that those of you who are interested in policy issues actually get on your computer go to that uh, website that he's been uh, repeating and take a look at some of their studies. They're, uh, they're pretty good. Uh, I mean, they're, they're not, uh, you're not going to find yourself being bored. They're, they are very, very well produced. So uh, to my regular audience, I would like you to remember to come back and see us next Monday, as always. By the way, we just had our 10th anniversary. Thanks for being with us. Goodbye. <laughs>